Okay. Welcome to the second class of CS224. Uh, this is section three of computer organization. I see a lot more people found the room today. Uh, you weren't here last time. That's okay. We just did a brief introduction to the mechanics of the course and the administration. It's all on the website, so you just go to the CS224 website to get all those details. We also did about the first half of the chapter one slides, so you can get those also on the website. And lastly, we're being videotaped. So Emre, uh, he's the guy in the back uh, who's taking these videotapes, and we believe that those are going to be available for you to watch if you should miss class. So if you missed the first class, um, let's find out a way to have the videotapes available so they can watch what they missed. Actually, we have more than double the attendance. Okay. I'm sorry for the delay. There were some technical problems here. I took the advantage to try to fix my own technical problems uh, by photocopying here because our faculty uh, photocopy place was closed. So I have now something I'd like you to do. It's an exercise to get to know you a little bit better better to know what uh, background you have in this material, to know if you've taken the course before, also where you're from, what your hobbies and interests are. So this is a little bit of a student survey. Yeah, I'm going to pass these out and please take about five or six or seven minutes to uh, complete the survey form and uh, I'll collect those and then we'll begin the class. All right, the last slide that we showed at the end, could I have your attention? Thanks. The last slide that we showed at the end of the previous lecture was this about the AMD Barcelona. And you can see that it's a quad core chip and we talked about its architecture. So we were working on the issue of where are the technologies for a computer. Processors are more or less at this point. Now let's continue. Um, let's talk about hard drive magnetic storage. This graph shows a scattergram of various uh, hard drive points in terms of capacity versus time. And you can see it's pretty scattered. There's a wide divergence in hard drives because of various needs. All hard drives don't need to be at the same place, so there's cost performance trade-offs. But at least size uh, moves roughly linearly with that yellow line. But it's not linear, of course, because you can see that this axis is a uh, uh, exponential power of 10 axis. It turns out that disk capacity is going up about 60 percent per year. So if we were to extrapolate the red line up to 2010, which is here, I would say that it would only be about 10,000 uh, megabytes, which is 10 gigabytes. So in reality, it, it, in light of the fact that 100 and 200 and bigger 300, 500 gigabyte hard drives are around today, it looks like what they need to do is adjust it and make it steeper. Perhaps it's going up faster than 60% per year. But that's a pretty steep rate of exponential change. 60% per year for uh, disk capacity for the same size. Obviously, if you get a bigger form factor, then you can include more uh, storage capacity. Wrong place. Here we go. Now let's talk about communication. We're in the internet age. Uh, the tremendous change in communication from postal and telephone systems to internet is unlike any revolution we've ever seen in the past. Printing press is a revolution. Radio and TV were revolutions. Newspapers, so on. But this is huge. In a very, very short time, uh, 400 million, that's old now. I, I read recently there's 600 million at least uh, stationary end users. That means connected, and that doesn't count any of the mobile users. And now, of course, there's lots and lots of mobile internet and an outstanding 1.2 billion wireless users. That means cell phone included, and not all of those are internet connected. But look at residential internet subscriptions. This is people paying, month, paying money every month to their um, internet service provider, and it's ramping up very, very nicely. Uh, so about uh, more than two-thirds of this number is people that are paying at their residence. Then there's also, of course, lots and lots of businesses and institutions, companies and educational, and so on. So they, we have a huge rise in... Um, internet connectivity. Anybody heard of Gordon Moore or Moore's Law? Okay, heard of or Moore's Law? Okay, Gordon Moore was a uh, president of Intel. And in 1965, which uh, now is the 35th anniversary, no, 45th anniversary, Gordon Moore predicted that the number of transistors on a chip that could be integrated uh, would double about every two years. Okay, that's called Moore's Law. So what that means, of course, is that you have this tremendous increase in the capacity of chips. And what these are are microprocessor uh, capacities. On a logarithmic scale, this is the number of transistors included. The last data point was 2005, with somewhere on the order of 2 to 3 uh, billion transistors. But now if you extend it out to 2010, we're, well, of course, well over 10 billion transistors on a single chip. And Gordon Moore has not proved wrong. And that's pretty good given that it was 45 years ago. Um, the 
1.7 billion was the data point on that place on the slide. There's a little picture of Gordon Moore, and um, his law, of course, applies not only to processors, but also to memory. So dynamic RAMs, or DRAMs, track pretty well, as you can see here, the microprocessor curves as well. These are just capacity sizes of DRAMs. 2005 gave us a 2 gigabit DRAM, and 2005 gave us, you know, Intel's Itanium processors. Now, uh, we've moved on five more years since that, but he's turned out to be true. Um, if we talk about scaling, okay, this is very accurate as well. Smallest feature size, in other words, the size of a gate of a uh, MOSFET transistor or the size of a line moving down from 90 nanometers, 65, 45, 32, this year, 22 nanometers. Now, nano, hear the word, nanotechnology, all the things being done in nano research and nanotechnology are becoming directly related to uh, switching in uh, integrated circuits. And so if you have this size feature, this is how many uh, billion transistors you can integrate on a chip of maximum size. So 2, 4, 6, 16 billion, 32 billion transistors. That's a lot of computing capacity or a lot of memory storage capacity. So there's the roadmap. And this, of course, if you're running a silicon foundry, you're looking ahead and designing your processes reaching those target dates, but it's moving down, as you can see, into the size of molecules and even soon single atoms. So that's very interesting. Um, that was the 2008 reference point. Um, about 45 nanometer transistors. Um, you can fit 30 million onto the head of a pin. Uh, you can fit more than 2,000 across uh, one single human hair. Um, if car prices had fallen at the same price as a transistor has since 1968, you would buy a, a brand new car for about one karoosh, okay? If it had, but it didn't, okay? Semiconductor industry, of course, is the uh, champion of all of technology. The whole technological revolution is related to this and Gordon Moore's law and the feature scaling that I just showed you. So because of this, for 40 years, we've had continuous improvements at 60% per year rate, okay? A new generation about every two to three years, 30% reduction in dimension, which causes, that's a single dimension, so when you square it, you get about 50% reduction in size. That causes 30% reduction in delay, so 50% increase in speed. Uh, the current generation and all generations try to reduce cost and increase performance from the previous generation uh, by fabricating the processors um, more and more on a given ingot into wafers. Those are then etched and create the transistors. There's a nice uh, flow of semiconductor fabrication in your textbook, which I encourage you to look at. The wafers are then chopped up into things called dye, okay, or chips, um, and uh, some of which are bad. Those are thrown away. The yield is the percentage of good ones that the company can sell. And then the next generation just ends up with more transistors on the same size chip. Therefore, they can put more functions and more features. Here's the uh, picture I was telling you about. A, sil a silicon ingot is like a big salam, okay, of pure silicon. Uh, they dope in some impurity materials, but they try to make it as pure as, as possible. This is basically beach sand, okay? Beach sand refined with all the impurities gotten out. You take this sausage of pure silicon and you slice it with a diamond saw to make wafers. The wafers are very, very thin. Silicon devices are planar, so we really only need one surface of this, so it doesn't really need to be very thick. Just need a solid material. It's sort of like glass. It cracks. It's a, it's a perfect crystal. Silicon is in, in uh, period four of the periodic table of elements. After the wafers are processed in 20 to 40 steps, they end up looking like this, okay? And each of these contains, you know, as we said, you know, two to four to eight to 12 billion transistors on a single chip. Many, many chips are on, the, on a wafer. The size of the wafer is determined by the original width of the ingot. The number of chips is, of course, determined by how big a chip has to be. Anyway, after all these processing steps, the wafer is tested. So individual uh, wafers, individual chips are tested and the bad ones are marked. It's unrecoverable. There's no repair possible. So those, after they're diced, are going to be thrown away. The dicer simply cuts the chips on the lines between them on their boundaries, causing individual chips. The bad ones are tossed away. The good ones are bonded into packages. That means that the chip has to have a connection to the outside of the package where the pin will connect it electrically to the rest of the circuit. So we bond in the package. And now we have package dies. As you know, for microprocessors, they're large packages, mostly to get the heat out and to have enough room for the pins. 
Then we test these individual parts. We tested the individual die here before they were diced on the wafer and found a few bad ones. Turns out these extra steps can cause some more uh, defects to arise, as well as issues related to the electrical speed and uh, power and so forth. So some more are thrown away, and the good ones can be sold and shipped to customers. So that's a very oversimplified diagram of the semiconductor manufacturing process. Any questions about that? If you want to do that, you need to find some businessmen willing to lay down about $2 billion to build a plant, okay? So uh, most countries don't have this capability, and the time to get it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So the Far East has jumped in on this. As far as I know, Europe, North America, those are pretty much the locations for this. So there's a, there's a competition among this. If you offer this capability, now you can say to any company, come, we'll make your parts for you. We have, you know... 32 nanometer uh, CMOS uh, low power technology. Come and make your parts on it. Or we have, you know, ECL, or we have 22 nanometer, or we will have this, that, you know, and you can quote prices and talk volumes, and companies can decide to go with you or not go with you. Now, some companies don't want to source out their technology to third party uh, silicon foundries. They build their own, they're in house. So, Texas and Intel and some others will own their own, but most companies can't afford to lay down a $2 billion investment. So the factory that does this shares and makes parts from many different companies. And so where it's made is not necessarily where it's designed, and it's not necessarily owned by the same company that, that uh, puts their label on the outside. So you can stamp your company number here even if it wasn't built in your factory. Okay? So I just want you to know about this. So if you design chips, you'll send them to one of these places to build you. 10,000 or 100,000 or 100 million, okay? And uh, they'll quote you a price and then you'll, they'll ship directly to your customers if you like, or you can warehouse them yourself. Now the main driver behind this is the scaling of devices. And so here's a little bit older slide that shows how we got from 350 nanometer smallest feature size to 250 to 180 to 130 to 90. Can you see what's happening? As the 250 shrinks, the area shrinks as the square of it. So going from 350 to 65 uh, ends up reducing the area to, as you can tell, way less than 10% of the original area. You can fit, um, if when you shrink the uh, circuit size down, you can fit twice the circuitry in the same space of architectural, uh, if you use innovation, or you could just put the same circuitry in half the space. You can reduce the cost, or you can use the extra space to put in extra circuitry. And either way, the effect of this half the die size for the same capability uh, than the, in the prior process. So it gives you a huge advantage when you can shrink the feature size down. Now what's happened to clock rates is that clock rates were going up for a while, and in fact they leveled off, but have now started to even come down. And the reason here is a power reason. You can look at uh, from 1982 up to 2007, which is a 25 year period, clock rates didn't continue to have the steep rise as you would expect. And the reasons behind that are that as you clock it faster, power goes up as the square. Okay, and so when you hit 100 watts for a chip, it's too much power to get out. And the heat uh, dissipation technologies end up becoming very, very expensive. I have a friend that works for uh, a company that uses uh, heat pipes to get heat out of very high energy uh, silicon chips. A heat pipe is a high expensive technology. It's way up above fans and, and uh, heat sinks. And it costs a lot of dough. And the only people that pay his company that kind of money are military contractors that are designing uh, uh, expensive, very expensive military electronics to go in jets and tanks and planes and stuff like that. And so to get the heat out is very important to make the product reliable and work. And they can pay. You know, defending a nation and its citizens costs money and everybody expects that, you know, hammers cost $100 and toilet seats cost $50 and, and uh, heat pipes cost, you know, in the hundreds of dollars. But you and I cannot afford heat pipes to get the heat out of our uh, personal computers. So when it gets up to 100 watts, everybody knows 100 watts is too hot to touch. If you touch a 100 watt light bulb and hold your fingers there, you burn your fingers. There's a very high temperature on the surface of 100 watts. So that, getting that out by fans and heat sinks really is a challenging problem process, and the right thing to do is to back off from that. Do you notice the relation between the shape of this and the shape of this? Look at those two curves. Yeah. Clock speed is directly, directly related to heat. In fact, as the square, as the square. So, uh, to cool it down and to not stress the mechanical engineering aspects of heat flow required lowering clock rates. Okay, clock rates hit the power wall. That's a better way to say it. 
For the Pentium 6, this is a guy commenting on uh, uh, Pentium's uh, history. Uh, success criteria, in other words, what the definition of a successful project, included performance above a certain level, and failure criteria included power dissipation above a certain level. So it's a successful project if we can perform above this performance threshold, and it's a failed project if our power goes above a power threshold. That's an interesting way to design because you can see that they work against each other. One way to get better performance is what? <coughs> Crank up the clock speed. But that's going to get you over the power wall too. So engineers are in this uh, tight space between trying to get performance but not burn too much power in doing so. And so as a consequence, you can see here, over time, processor performance is actually flattened out. Look at this. Nice steep rise. If I continue this, where will it go? Right on up like here. Did it? No, it didn't. This comes out to 2002, 2004, 2006. It leveled and flattened off in the middle of this decade that we're just ending. It leveled and flattened off. Look at the growth rates here. 25% per year. After the risk revolution kicked in, about 52% per year. After the power wall hit, less than 20% per year. So this is not a happy curve for computer engineers and computer consumers that are used to that curve. Somebody's got to do something here. Is it my friend with his hundreds of dollars heat pipes? Is that the solution? Just keep cranking it up 200 watts, 300 watts, 400 watts. You know, we'll have to have co air conditioning and cooling systems to keep computer power under control. Is that the solution? His company would love it if everybody had heat pipes all around the world in their laptops and their desktops. They'd be, they'd be happy as could be, but those are hundreds of dollars and even in the finely tuned expensive one, thousands of dollars devices. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, so then what is the solution? Limit the power, find another way to get performance besides clock speed. Limit the power, but find another way to get performance besides clock speed. And that other way is right there. Use the extra transistors that the uh, area allows at a lower clock frequency in multiple processors per chip. We call them multiple cores. The power challenge of the, this generation and this decade has forced a whole change in the design of microprocessors. Was it possible to have multi-cores before? Sure. Why didn't they? They didn't hit the power wall. Now we've hit the power wall, plus Moore's law is just giving us all kinds of real estate to build transistors on. And so this is one of those perfect storm configurations where it's the time. Since 2002, the rate of improvement in, as I just showed, has really slowed down from a factor of 1.5, which is 50% improvement per year, to a factor of 1.2, that's 20% improvement per year. So as of 2006, all desktop and server companies are shipping microprocessors with multiple processors in the chip, multiple cores in the chip. Here's an example. Four cores per chip, two cores per chip, even eight cores per chip in 2006. And now we're four years down from that. And look what the clock rates are. I remember microprocessors were over three heading on up to four gigahertz. In this list, only the IBM Power 6 is listed as that high. We backed off 2.5, 2.5, 1.4 gigahertz. Where's the power level at? Burn your fingers. It's right up against the limit. You know, it's just at the place. Obviously, slowing the clock down will slow the power down too. But this much heat can get out using conventional technologies of fans and heat sinks. But going much higher than this causes trouble. I would have to say this one looks like it could be in trouble. Okay, this one backed off a little more conservatively. How did it manage to get performance? Wow! Such a slow clock rate. Wow, the power's backed off from your comp com competition. So what are you guys doing? Well, how about eight cores per chip? That's what we're doing. Yeah. So Sun has gone with multiple multi-cores even faster than AMD and Intel and IBM. But they're all multi-core, as you can see here. And that's going to be the story for the rest of your uh, career as an engineer. The plan is to double the number of cores per chip every generation, about every two years. Why is that? Because the real estate on the chip is going to shrink and give you that space to do that every two years. So every generation is going to have double cores. Any questions about that? Dope. So far, the key message of this talk today is that the power wall has caused us to change our mind about clock speeds and given the green light to multiple core. It was available already because of Moore's law. The real estate is there, but using it in parallel architecture was a kind of a scary boundary to cross because parallelism involves all kinds of interesting control that you don't have with a single processor. Lots of new issues, 
But the reality was people's fingers were getting burned on the power wall. And so we just had to do this. And so that's going to be our course's goal is to get up to multi-core, multi-processor by the end. First, we're going to work very hard to understand how a single processor's architecture is uh, designed and based upon lots of principles, how you get good performance out of one, then we're just going to scale it because the real estate says you've got room for more. Okay? So any questions about that principle? That's the main point that we've made so far is, is this. Why? You know the answer now. Why do we have multi-cores? How come we didn't have them sooner? How come the clock rates have gone down? Da, 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 da. What are they doing over there in the nanotechnology center? There's some connection between all this. I hope that that's been made clear. Any questions at all about this? Okay, then I'm going to move to a new topic, um, if that's all right with you. The new topic is workloads and benchmarks. Now, workload is the amount of work that uh, somebody or some machine has to do, including computers. Computers process programs, so if you give them a bunch of programs, that's the workload. If you look at the programs that are run over a period of time, the average workload of this server, the average workload of this PC, blah, 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 you can talk like that. That's what it is. A workload is the real programs run by a real machine. Now, a benchmark is something different. A benchmark is a measuring tool, okay? Benchmarks are used in all kinds of different areas of life, but computer benchmarks are special programs that measure how long a particular computer takes to execute that program. Sometimes benchmarks are a group of programs in order to get the uh, total time to execute all 10 or all 20. And so if I run a benchmark on your computer and I run the same benchmark on your computer and I get done in five seconds on you and 10 seconds on you, I can conclude that you are twice as slow as this other computer. Okay, now that's great, but the question remains, is the benchmark program or set of programs I'm running bear any relationship to my workload? Okay, if I'm a web server and I give floating point intensive numeric calculation programs to you and you and you win the race, does that mean that I should buy your computers for my web server? No, because the workload and the benchmark are not related to each other. So that means now we need to have lots of different kinds of benchmarks for database applications, for web applications, for floating point intensive scientific calculations, which are appropriate to the uses of the various uh, consumers of computers in industry. So we're going to have a wide set of benchmarks which are going to be used as testing tools to find out the performance of computers so that before you spend your hard-earned money you know what you're going to get in return. Nobody wants to say, oh that sounds like a good deal, buy it and find out the performance is inadequate. Remember what I said in the first lecture, you are highly likely as a computer engineer to be consulted about purchasing decisions because you're expected to understand about performance. You're expected to understand about machine and system performance. And you say, man, I hope they don't ask me because I don't know anything. Well, maybe right now you don't. But one of the goals of this course is to get you to where you have an intelligent opinion so that you can assess performance and talk about price performance ratios and be able to give your boss or the manager or the owner of your company some wise advice about how to spend their money. Maybe it'll be you choosing. Maybe it'll just be you giving input to the purchasing decision. But it's very likely that computer engineers would be the people. I mean, why would somebody from a management department or somebody trained in marketing or sales or economics know very much about computer performance? They wouldn't be expected to. Who would be expected to know about computer performance? Mm, you guys. Okay, so that's why that's an important business. Okay, benchmarks are a set of programs that form a artificial workload, okay, specifically chosen to measure performance. And SPEC, the System Performance Evaluation Cooperative, SPEC for short, creates these standard sets of benchmark programs for various applications. It started in 89. The latest is 2006 for CPUs. And it consists of 12 different integer programs that, that are benchmarks and 17 different floating point programs, which are benchmarks of processor performance. Okay? There's also benchmarks for all kinds of other things power workloads, mail workloads, media workloads, da 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 web workloads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they've been quite busy creating uh, these uh, benchmarks. Let's have a look at an earlier set of benchmarks. In 2002, the integer programs consisted of these, and the floating point programs consisted of these. Now, um, you may have know some of the names of some of these. Anybody heard of GZIP? 
It's a file compression program. Maybe you use WinZip or RAR or something like that, but it's a, it's a compression program. VPR is a place and route program for FPGAs, including uh, the kind of program that's buried in the middle of the Xilinx suite because your circuit has to be placed and routed into the FPGAs that we use. GCC, maybe you've heard of the new G, G compiler, C compiler, sorry. Uh, probably not heard about MCF for combinatorial optimization. Chess programs, obviously, those are a wide category. Crafty's one that they've chosen. Word processing, uh, computer visualization, Perl application, uh, group theory interpreter, Vortex, which is an object-oriented database program, BZIP2, which is another compression, and T-Wolf, a circuit place and route. These are integers. They don't deal with any floating point numbers. They're just dealing with uh, integers. Now let's move over to some scientific programs. I'm pretty sure you will not have heard of these, but you should certainly recognize the categories. Quantum chromodynamics, shallow water modeling, multi-grid solver in three-dimensional fields, parabolic elliptic uh, partial differential equations. Partial differential equations should ring some bells. 3D graphics libraries, computational fluid dynamics, including the kind of program that would model getting heat out of, because fluid includes heat flow, getting heat out of a processor. Image recognition, seismic wave propagation. Yeah, I'm sure people are using eQuake here in Turkey very heavily if you're in geology and seismic research because uh, this is obviously an earthquake country. Uh, face recognition, uh, computational chemistry, testing for primes. We've all heard of the big computer programs that find prime numbers, right? We know that's an interesting thing to do. There's a value in doing that. It's more than just interesting. Crash simulation, nuclear physics, uh, acceleration. You don't have to build a huge particle accelerator. If you use six track, you can simulate acceleration of particles. And finally, pollution distribution. When you have an oil spill, when you have a nuclear uh, meltdown, how fast do those pollutants radiate out and move into the environment. So these are all obviously going to be computationally intensive programs with floating point numbers. If you run uh, the integer suite from 2006, some are the same, some are different. Notice the date change, so some of the programs, every revision, kick out the ones that seem to be less useful, bring in some new ones. If you run it on a Barcelona at 2.5 gigahertz, here's what you get. You get the uh, in number of instructions, you get the uh, cycles per instruction, you get the total execution time, you get a reference time, and you get a spec ratio. And it turns out that the spec ratio down here averaged over all these can be compared to somebody else's chip running the same programs, okay? So that this number becomes a useful reference. Or if you say, well, actually, I'm really not interested in all those, but compiling and uh, processing of you know, certain programs is my interest, then you just look at the subset that matters to you. You can also do it yourself. You don't have to go to a website and look at somebody else's testing. You can actually do it yourself. You say, well, I wanted, I'm thinking of considering buying the 2.0 gigahertz Barcelona with more memory than they used and a smaller hard drive and a different operating system. You can set these tests up yourself as well. All these are open source code and you can compile them and run them yourself and get your own test results. Anyway, you'll notice that the 11.7 .7 is not the arithmetic mean it's the geometric mean. It's not the normal ortolema that you're used to. Add them all up and divide by n. That's the arithmetic mean. It's a geometric mean, which involves the nth root after they're multiplied together. Now, other, other performance metrics would include things like power consumption. Okay, that's become very, very important, especially in the embedded market where battery life is important. If you're an embedded processor and you're dependent on a battery in some small appliance that uh, you know you, people are carrying around and not connecting to um, the wall very often, then your power consumption is going to be directly related to how long you go between battery charges. So when you buy a cell phone, sure, one of the questions you ask is, how long does it run on one charge? And if the answer is one day, you're not too happy. If it's three weeks, you're really happy, right? We're all concerned for that sort of thing. So therefore, power consumption matters. For limited power applications, the most important metric is actually power efficiency. How efficient are we on the power for the computation that I need to do? Here's an older slide with three Pentiums. Pentium 4M, Pentium M, and Pentium 3M running at three different clock speeds. Notice this Pentium M actually has two. It's got a Low, low, a, high, a low power mode and a high power mode. Obviously, when you increase the clock speed, it burns more power. And so now running the spec integer and spec floating point uh, uh, applications for all three of these machines, when you're always um, on maximum clock, when you're in laptop mode, which means it decides whether it should run high or low power, or when you're always on minimum power, minimum clock mode, gives these kind of results. And interestingly enough, 
the light blue, not the medium blue, this is light blue, the medium blue one gives the best power efficiency in every case, the best relative efficiency in every case. And the reason is because it's able to uh, go between the two. Even though it's a, 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 a processor with a higher speed than this one, and this is a lower, all the time lower clock speed, um, it, it beat it, as you can see, even in, in this mode here. So let's summarize and think about performance. How do you summarize the performance in a single number? Well, we said earlier you use the geometric mean. So what's done here is the product from uh, 1 to n of all the spec ratios, those were the values in the final columns there, uh, multiply together and then the nth root of that to get the geometric mean. Just like added together and divided by n is the arithmetic mean. And so you average them together in this way to get a single number. And that number is useful in comparing uh, computers against each other. All right, now, briefly, back to our course. Uh, this course will look at com computer organization in two different categories. One is going to be kind of the architecture, and one is going to be kind of the engineering category. The architecture category we'll do first, and we're going to look at how the instruction set uh, architecture is designed, what the interfaces are like, how we interface to the compiler, what it looks like in a system. And so this view is the architect's view of the thing. The, what's the building going to be like? This is the engineer's view. How are we going to build it? We'll be looking at the organization of the units, the hardware components, and how the logic design is done. So here's the nuts and bolts. This is the, the construction engineer's view. And our, our course will cover both. At times, we'll be working here in the details. At times, we'll be working here at the higher level view. Uh, but obviously, both will be important to us. Uh, what are you going to get from this course? If you work hard and if you do the uh, required assignments to an expected level, you'll gain an in-depth understanding of how modern computers work on the inside, how they evolve to get where they are, what trade-offs are present uh, at the hardware-software boundary. You'll understand in a deep way, in-depth understanding. Uh, you'll have insight into what makes things go slow and fast and what things are easy and hard to implement um, in hardware. You'll also get experience with the design process. This is so important. Engineers must be able to be designers. And experience with the design process means you will have gone through the design cycle working in a team, doing design from specification, serious design from specification, not little toy, but fairly rigorous, multi-week, multi-member team design uh, at least two different times in the context of large, complex uh, projects. You'll be given a functional specification. It'll be your responsibility to come up with control and data path, simulate it, and make a physical implementation using modern CAD tools. And the final thing that's in this course for you is you will have a lot more tools in your designer's conceptual toolbox. You know, as an engineer, you go through life with an imaginary toolbox. It's actually located here. But that toolbox is full of approaches and concepts to handle difficult system design problems. This course is going to equip you with some more of those. Actually, your whole lifetime, your whole career will be building tools in that toolbox, refining and understanding how to use them effectively. But right now, especially in university at the beginning, we're putting tools in the toolbox and giving you some experience with them. Anyway, in this conceptual toolbox of things that engineering designers need, what kind of tools are we going to try to put in in this course to help you be a stronger engineer in the future in your career? Okay, the first tool is going to be evaluation techniques. We need to evaluate something to say, is A better or is B better? You need some ways to do that. We're going to do that a lot in this course. We're going to be comparing and putting a number on so that we can make a judgment about this is better than this because of this according to this characteristic. So techniques for evaluating. Another one is going to be this idea of translation of levels. At high levels, things are abstract and ugly detail is hidden, but you don't exactly know how it's going to do it. If you translate it down, you have the same thing, but at a lower level of detail with less abstraction and more information. So compilation and assembly, of course, is one example of translation of language, concepts, and meaning through various levels, but we'll actually see some other examples as well. Another thing is hierarchy. This idea that uh, some things are made up of other things and they have an order of importance or an order of relation and some are closer to the source and some are further away. For example, we'll be t discussing in this course a concept called memory hierarchy. And you can see registers and cache and memory and hard disk are all forms of memory, but they're formed in a hierarchy. 
and they have different characteristics according to their, it's like a pyramid. And so the base of the pyramid uh, will be the lowest level, and we'll have a lot of it. At the top of the pyramid, up in the air, close to the processor, will be our registers. We, will have very, we will not have very many of those at all. Another conceptual toolbox is the, or con tool in our toolbox, is the idea of parallelizing things to speed them up. Okay, doing tasks uh, consecutively and sequentially gets the jobs done but slower and speeding them up by doing them in parallel including pipelining the tasks is a way to gain performance so we'll be looking at how to parallelize things and make them go faster we're we'll, we already talked about uh, multi-core so you can sell that if I have two processors or four processors on a chip I could do four instructions in parallel I'm going to show you how to do multiple instructions in parallel even on one chip um, by pipelining Okay, static and dynamic scheduling. That's another concept here. When you have to schedule tasks, do you schedule them once for all in the beginning and then say, I hope that's right for all cases, or do I have a scheduling algorithm that's dynamic that adjusts to load and demand and situations? Dynamic algorithms always are harder and more complicated, uh, but they'll give better performance if done well. Uh, static algorithms that say one size fits all uh, are easier to design, but they may not give the best performance in every case. Um, Static versus dynamic, that's a very big concept that all engineers, whether they're software or bridge or, you know, earthquake or computer engineers need to understand. Okay, um, indirection and address translation. Uh, here's the thing, here's the address of the thing, here's the address of the place that has the address of the thing. Indirection is reference but not direct reference. And so we're going to do quite a bit of that when we're looking for addresses of data and addresses of instructions. Okay, we're going to look at the concepts of timing and clocking and latching even deeper than we did in CS223 because this is crucial to performance. I've already mentioned how important it is to power as well, but timing and clocking and latching issues will come up in this course. Um, programs that allow us to do a high-level engineering analysis like computer-aided design programs and languages that describe at high level and simulation programs. You'll get access to all those in this course. And of course, anytime you're designing anything, you need tools, and all these are tools in order to help us. Physical building blocks, like a carry look ahead adder, like a register file, like an arithmetic logic unit, we're going to see that building blocks allow us to make things. Nobody builds anything in Turkey unless they understand a whole lot about tulas and kiramits and, and uh, beton and demir and all the building blocks of construction. You've got to understand the building blocks. You can't make a building unless you know your materials very well. And then finally, we've already begun this, technology trends. You can't be a designer effective in 2010 unless you know how we've come, which implies where we're going, especially things like Moore's Law. They, they allow us to predict into the future with high accuracy. So knowing the technology trends and what's flattening out and when the wall is coming. I mean, just one short trip over to the Nanotechnology Center and a few questions about semiconductor physics will help you to understand when we're going to hit the scaling wall. Okay, 22 nanometers, how about 2 nanometers? How about 0.2 nanometers? How about 0.02? Somewhere along the line they're going to say, uh-uh, no, no, no. Silicon doesn't work like that. The silicon atoms, silicon electrons, silicon uh, properties are not going to hold. They're going to give up. So forget it. That's your wall. So we can see the wall coming. Okay, I'm just going to suggest that technology trends allow leadership engineers to see ahead into the future in order to design and be ready for it. The worst thing is being surprised by the future. Okay, if the oil industry suddenly finds that people are moving to electric cars, they're going to be in really bad shape. If the automobile industry finds that people are moving to public transportation or moving to, you know, personal helicopters or something, they're going to be in terrible shape. You've got to look ahead and see where's the future going and get there and be ready before it gets there. So that last principle, we've done some already, but that's so, so important. If you don't want to be a leadership engineer, if you just want to be a follower, yes, boss, okay, you're supposed to have all the vision, then that's fine. But I think most of you want to be leadership engineers. You want to be people that are setting the direction and setting the trend in your company and your business and in your, your world. So therefore, you need to have not just a kind of an, you know, at gozuklu garush, you need to have this wide kushbakish garush as well, okay? So that's part of what we're trying to do in this course as well in the hardware area. You should be looking for that also in the software area, looking for that in the systems area, looking ahead in the area of applications. Everybody's heard the phrase killer applications. 
Well, what are the killer applications going to be in 2015 and 2020? And how can you get there before they get there? Okay? So these are, this is the kind of thinking that Bill Kent uh, graduates need to be doing. If you want to be a leader, you've got to be ahead of the game. If you're just a follower, you say, where are we going? Okay, you know, and I'll go there too. But that's not going to get you anywhere. You know, that means that somebody else is making the decision, somebody else is calling the shots, and you're just high, high boss. Um, I think most of you would say, no, that's not my goal in life, just to be high, high boss. You want to be in a position where you're saying, look, I think we need to be there. I think we ought to be doing this. I think that our company's direction should be this or our government's direction or whatever you're doing. Okay, uh, the good news is that with that little speech about where you want to be, that's our last slide, and the lesson is done. So today, this week was uh, three and a half hours, <laughs> and I could have made it three if I had looked ahead a little bit and cut the talk short. Have a nice uh, rest of the week. I guess I'll see you again on uh, Friday. Friday's our next day. Thank you. Thank you.